uh, it should seem to be true that at least 12 parts to Dr. Kiki Ray Holt has seen the pain at least for this. And that's where we're going to be much. Why would you bring these concessions to the fair labor partner and then have to make a whole series of new concessions to Hamas? I'm going to get a chance to put that on there. I'll 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 put that on there. That would remove one of their grievances. Not something they really care about that much, but it gives them support uh, in the wider world. If there was democracy in the Arab world, which was perceived to be possible in the last few weeks, that is something that would remove one of their grievances. Again, I say that if you solve those problems and make them a headway in dealing with them, you aren't going to actually solve their eventual grievance, which will require you to sit down and talk to them politically. So, in my view, you do have to open the channel, you do have to uh, find a way of talking to them. As I say, Northern Ireland has been to uh, this part of 30 years uh, in fact, the channel of getting to the last few weeks. It may well take the same sort of time with the Taliban and Al Qaeda, which is why I'd like you breaking that channel now, even if now is not the time for negotiations. I ask myself, what is the alternative? And rather unfairly, I think quite a, a, a very short sentence from uh, Mitchell's book. He says, The American people have learned that killing or capturing every terrorist is not operationally possible, politically feasible, or financially affordable. The attempt to do so may well be counterproductive, supporting more terrorists than it removes the battlefield. I think that really, for me anyway, is true pretty much everywhere. The Queen of Ireland in 1916 wasn't the, the uprising and the GDW, it was actually the way the Brits dealt with uh, Republicans by looking at the wrong ones, killing the wrong ones, and doesn't the right ones go. Uh, or in terms of people. So it's the it's a reaction to what often causes the problem that is you know, geared up to the end of the day, the voice of the on. So I think that's a contradiction in Mitchell's argument. If, this, that, if that quote is right, then why would that not apply to everything? Where are the examples of the right person? So it seems to be the only solution I can see for any country insurgency is that pressure down in particular terms and the political way out. And I think that essentially, I'm optimistic enough, I'm progressive, I believe that there are solutions to all of these conflicts. If you believe in it, if you put yourself into it, you put off, and if you use uh, uh, normal situation. And one way I suspect we'll find that solution in Afghanistan. I'd like to uh, thank John for inviting me here this evening, and Katie and everyone associated with King's College for making all the arrangements. I'd also like to say that it's good to see my old colleague, Jonathan Powell, again. The two of us are living proof that there is life after government service. <laughs> now, I've been asked this evening to debate the question of whether we should negotiate with Al Qaeda. I don't believe we should. In fact, I think it is dangerous to our national security interests and our values if we even attempt to do so. But I want to start by conceding a major point to John, namely that he is correct in arguing that there are times when it might make sense for a government to negotiate with a terrorist insurgent group. Obviously, Northern Ireland was one of those cases. He, Prime Minister Blair, and many officials in the British and Irish governments, and many persons across Northern Ireland, should be applauded for their dedication and determination in laboring many years to finally end the troubles. Northern Ireland was a much better place for their efforts. But it would be unusual to say the least, if it were always true that government should negotiate with terrorists and insurgent groups. In fact, in my country, many, perhaps most people, passionately believe the opposite, that we should never negotiate with terrorists and insurgents. I think we can all agree, and I think that Jonathan has already conceded the point, where there are circumstances where it makes sense to negotiate and circumstances where it does not. In such a complex world, with so many terrorist and insurgent groups distinct in their ideology, history, culture, and politics, surely it's highly unlikely that any one size fits all, that any one approach would work equally well in every case. In fact, recent history shows that terrorist groups can be ended in a variety of ways. Since 1968, according to a recent Rand Corporation study, 40% of all terrorist groups were ended by transitioning to a political process. The RAND study concluded that the possibility of a political solution is inversely proportional to the breadth of terrorist goals. 
the narrower the goals of a terrorist organization, the more likely it can achieve them without violent action, and the more likely the government and the terrorist group may be able to reach a negotiated solution. Now this sounds encouraging, until you realize that it means that 60% of terrorist groups do not renounce violence and do not make a transition to politics. For these terrorist groups, a variety of instruments have been used to defeat them, including the use of the police, the intelligence services, and the military. So the question then becomes, when does it make sense to negotiate, and when doesn't it? And for policymakers and other government officials, how can you tell the difference? Are there any principles or lessons from previous experience that can help guide us when we make that decision? During my most recent time in government, I was unable to get good answers to these questions from the US intelligence community. So when I left the government, I spent the next three years traveling around the world interviewing military officers, intelligence professionals, security officials, government ministers, and even former terrorists to see if I could do better. The result is this highly readable book, <laughs> 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 Negotiating with Evil, When to Talk to Terrorists. It's available electronically or by print on demand. As we look ahead, determining if we negotiate or if we fight is going to be more important than ever before. The reason is because terrorism trends are all pointing in the wrong direction. According to most counterterrorism experts, the threat is growing. There will be more terrorist groups in the future than in the past. They will have more places to gather and scheme. They will have access to increasingly lethal technologies and weapons. It is telling that since 9-11, Al-Qaeda has engaged in more terrorist attacks on more continents with more sophisticated weapons than in its entire previous history. So should we negotiate with Al-Qaeda? The answer is no. This approach is not in the national security interests of the United States for three reasons. First, there is no evidence that Al-Qaeda has the slightest interest in talking with us. It really does take two to tango. It's not that hard for a terrorist group to signal that it's interested in negotiating with the government. In Northern Ireland, for example, after Bloody Sunday, the IRA indicated that it was willing to talk to the British. These early feelers led to the July 1972 meeting at Cheney Walk that Jonathan mentioned. And as we know, talks continued intermittently for two and a half decades until George Mitchell was able to construct a more formal diplomatic framework with the Good Friday Agreement. The difference is that Al-Qaeda is not the IRA. It has given no indication that it wishes to talk to us, intermittently or otherwise. The second reason not to negotiate has to do with our lack of understanding about Al-Qaeda. Let us imagine for a moment that Al-Qaeda indicated it did want to sit down and negotiate with the United States. What then? Well, first of all, we have to make sure the meeting wasn't a trap, that this person was discreet, that he was reliable, that he was who he claimed to be, that he was in fact representing Al-Qaeda and acting under its direction, that he had the authority to enter into binding commitments, and most importantly, that he had the ability to deliver on his promises. All this is far trickier than it sounds. Just a few weeks ago, for example, a fellow presented himself to NATO as a senior leader of the Taliban. In fact, he said he was the number two official next to Mullah Omar. Much fuss was made over this gentleman, and a good deal of money changed hands as he was ferried back and forth to Kabul for meetings with President Karzai and other senior Afghan officials. 